Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? Today was supposed to be the day where I tell you, The Black Second Edition is available for order. Want a signed trade paperback and ebook combo? Visit my site! Alas, that's not to be. As I mentioned last week, this re-release depended upon a large number of moving parts. Unfortunately, the biggest, most voracious modern reptile, I speak, of course, of the Amazonosaurus, is also the slowest damn beast in the world when it comes to servicing content creators and publishers. In other words, I don't have a book to sell you at the moment until Amazon gets their shit together and decides I have the rights to publish my own fucking book. Until published, it's now officially to be known as Schrodinger's book. I posted another health update on my site regarding my voice. If you're interested, follow the link in the show notes. The long and short of it is that my vocal cords are misbehaving and hopefully they'll be getting better relatively soon. Therefore, in the interest of giving my voice a little more rest and relaxation, I'll cut it off here and we'll get to the content. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 8 of Station 3. Chapter 8 A red light flashed above the exit hatch, and an alarm buzzed through his external mics, the noise thankfully limited by his filters. Air rushed out, the sound of it slowly fading to nothing. Hidden banks of UV lights flashed to sterilize their suits, and a moment later, the hiss of fresh air filled the chamber, filled his headset. The wide hatch cycled and opened into a narrow corridor. Overhead lights flickered as they struggled to come to life and banish the shadows. From what Zilf could see of the bare, uncoated bulkheads, aesthetics had been eschewed in favor of functionality and structural integrity. Griggs, already positioned at the hatch edge, turned and looked down one side of the corridor to the other. We're going to hit a bend at 50 meters, he said over the squad channel. No way to see around that corner. Clear up to it, Reiki said, no tension in her voice. Griggs didn't respond before stepping into the corridor, clearing the ceiling, and beginning a slow jog. His cam view appeared on Zilf's HUD, the camera's onboard sensors steadying the view. The corridor was more or less uniform up to the bend, the occasional maintenance pipe or duct winding its way in before winding back out. Griggs quickly reached the bend and came to a halt. As the corridor bent, fewer and fewer of the overhead lights seemed to work. Eventually, Darkness bathed the entire corridor for who knew how many meters. Zilf? Griggs asked. Any way to remotely turn on the lights? Zilf activated his engineering menu, searched for a live interface, found it, and hooked in. It took him less than 30 seconds to break the encryption, and once connected, he brought a virtual terminal to life. Good old Shin Shou. They believed in consistency and reliability. That also went for their ugly user interface design. You could dump nearly any list of commands into the HUD computer, and you could still find the pathways to execute them. The ugly interface was easy to use, and once you learned its secrets, faster than anything on the market. Using the contextual cues, he located Station 1, Module 1, colon 2, Emergency Crossover. An array of lists sprung to life. He navigated the power systems and chose reports. A quick glance told him everything he needed to know. Power disruption, Zilf said. It appears to run all the way to the junction. Is the junction offline? Reki asked. Good question. Zilf attempted to bring up the cameras, but they were dead. The power had been completely interrupted in that area. That meant it was going to get cold. Zilf shared the results with Reki and Griggs. We're right next to the module's skin, and that bend puts us into an actual tube that leads to the junction. The tube power is dead, and the cams are also out. Shit, Griggs said. Boss, we have time for a drone? Reki immediately said, No way. We need to get these people out of here sooner rather than later. Copy, Griggs said. What's taking so long? One of the techs asked. Zilf turned slightly and regarded their human charges. He wondered which one had spoken. Was their leader still alive? Also, what the fuck was actually going on here? Movement on the cam feed caught his attention. The filters engaged, and suddenly Zilf saw the world through a greenish haze. The next five meters of the deck and bulkheads appeared in fine detail, but the feed quickly dissolved into shadows beyond that range. Griggs broadened the focus on his helmet lamp, and another ten meters became visible. Looks clear to me, but I can't see all the way down. 
copy, Reiki said, the word dreamy and hesitant, as though it were more a reflex than an actual response. Command is talking to her, Zilf thought. Reiki tended to fade out of normal conversations with her team if the Huey comms were active. She was either getting new intel or new orders. Zilf hoped it was the former, not the latter. He didn't think new orders would mean anything other than killing the survivors or destroying the station, or both. We'll have to do, Reiki said after a moment. Griggs, hold. I am bringing the text. Copy, Griggs said. Zilf took a few steps back from the open hatch and waved the text forward. I'll be right behind you, he said through the suit's speakers. Just follow Reiki and you'll be safe. The shortest of the texts looked up at him. With the suit's visor down, it was impossible to see the face inside. Still, Zilf made out a shiver through the crinkly suit. Let's go, Reki said from the corner. She'd stepped across the threshold and taken a position a meter away, leaving plenty of room for the text. Right behind you, Zilf said again. The text staring at him seemed to nod before following their colleagues into the corridor. A moment later, Zilf was alone in the massive airlock. Reki appeared at the threshold. Get the six, she said, and walked past the hatchway. Zilf stepped out of the airlock and into the corridor. Now he was seeing it through his own eyes, he realized it was a bit more narrow than he'd first thought. The airlock was obviously large so it could be used to evacuate the entire module at once. However, this emergency corridor, probably the most secure part of Station 1, was barely large enough for he and Reki to stand side by side. If he had to move up and provide cover, it was going to be a tight squeeze. Zilf watched as Reki settled the text into an easy but determined pace. Zilf knew she didn't want them running unless there was a reason. Not only were the texts exhausted, but they might not be used to long stents in suits. If that was the case, they could collapse if pushed too hard. For every step Reki and her group took, Zilf moved toward a half step. He wanted at least 10 meters between himself and Reki's group, especially once they reached the elbow. Which they did, without incident. Fifty meters past the elbow, Griggs waited with his rifle pointed casually upward and every suit light active. The effect made him appear like an angel from some hollow comedy. If angels carried plasma rifles. Reki? Zilf asked over the private channel. Go. He tried to speak, but his voice cracked. Zilf cleared his throat and tried again. What's the infection? She didn't answer immediately. I can't say because we don't know. We don't know. Her way of saying the command hadn't told her, and at the very least, pretended they didn't know. In the world of the EET, it was always impossible to tell the difference. Copy, Zilf said. What was happening to them? The infected. Reki's group was more than halfway to Griggs now, and Griggs was moving forward, matching their pace as he scouted ahead. I don't know, she said. We'll have a full team briefing when we reach the redoubt. Copy. Zilf said, and killed the connection. I don't know. I don't know. Reki had basically told him she didn't have the information, and Command hadn't provided it. Either Command didn't know, or they weren't sharing. Zilf exhaled a long breath and focused on Griggs's cam feed. With all of his suit lights on, the greenish night vision view held a white aura at its edges, the distortion enough to occlude peripheral detail. Still, from what Zilf could see, the dark portion of the corridor appeared empty and secure. Zilf peered upward and froze. Vents. They were all closed, or at least appeared to be. Just as the quarantine alert had made it impossible to leave the airlock without a suit, the emergency's corridor air had been removed and blocked off. Still. Griggs, scan upward every once in a while and take a peek at the vents, Zilf said. There was a slight pause before Griggs's cam view raised to the ceiling. Vents. One spaced every three meters. Zilf continued flicking his gaze between the corridor ahead of him and Griggs's cam feed while he walked. Another meter or two. Check the ceiling. Closed vent. Next. Reki hadn't said anything and Zilf thought he knew why. She was probably still chatting with command while the connection was active, not to mention the fact she was hurting the text likely answering their questions as well, or trying to keep them calm. Griggs's cam feed jerked, and Zilf realized he had stopped walking. Reki's group halted after a slight pause with all the grace of a car wreck. Was open. 
Griggs said quietly. The cam feed showed Zilf a vent missing its grate. Griggs's cam panned around. There, he said. Sure enough, three meters away from the vent, a cracked and bent grate leaned up against the bulkhead. Griggs panned back to the ceiling. Recky, Griggs said. Pretty sure someone came through the vents. I see that, she snapped. Do you see anything else in the corridor? No, he admitted. Recky paused a beat before saying in a deadpan voice, Keep moving. Zilf hung back a little, turned in a slow circle, and checked the vents behind them. He found a broken grate lying just behind the hatchway. No one had even seen it. Shit, he said, Mike muted. Someone had definitely come through here via the vents, unless they went through the vents to get into the rest of the module which was even more insane than a person crawling through the ducts and crawl spaces to drop four meters to the deck when they could just use the hatch. Sylph continued walking slowly forward, but kept an eye on the rear cam. Someone was in here, somewhere. He brought up the map Recky had sent him and nodded to himself. They had one more bend, and then they'd be at the actual junction and the egress. Griggs, watch that next corner, he said. Yeah, was thinking the same thing. When Recky and her group turned the elbow, Griggs had already walked another ten meters ahead, his light banishing the darkness. Zilf continued flipping between the view out of his visor, Griggs's cam feed, and his own rear feed. An electric stab of fear hit his consciousness, but he ignored it and the hackles that rose on his skin. Stop being paranoid, he told himself. They're techs and workers, not trained killers. He knew that, but this was different. Whatever had been going on in the medical bay, whatever the infection happened to be, it was doing something strange to human biology. He knew that much, at least. Parasite? Airborne virus? You are protected inside a pressure suit, an EET suit no less, and have weapons and tools that can melt steel. You're afraid of a few sick people? Ridiculous, he knew, but the image of the ill station worker, his skin rippling as he tore into the unfortunate medical tech, wouldn't leave his mind. He'd never even heard of such a thing. Hold up, Griggs said over the comms. Zilf immediately halted, as did Recky. An unfortunate tech, not paying attention, bumped straight into Recky. It was unfair since the tech couldn't possibly have heard Griggs' command, but watching a hazmat suit try and take on an EET was comical. Hopefully the tech hadn't hurt themselves. It had probably been like walking into a bulkhead. What's up, Griggs? Recky asked. Zilf hadn't waited for Recky to ask the question. He'd already seen what Griggs had. Deep scratches scarred the bulkhead at the next elbow. He wasn't sure, but Zilf also thought he saw moisture. Considering there were kilometers below Zhao-2's surface, and an alien ocean simply bided its time until it could flood the puny human habitats, any leaks were a reason for concern. You see it? Griggs asked. Looks like a tool did the scratches. He continued forward, his plasma rifle pointed at an invisible spot two meters in front of him, rather than at his feet. The light twinkled off the sheen of liquid. The closer Griggs got, the more the sheen looked wrong. It wasn't water, too thick for that. It seemed more like mucus or some other biological fluid. Griggs closed the distance to the elbow and kept himself against the exterior facing bulkhead. Zilf knew what he was doing trying to give himself plenty of time and room for a fight. He could have just hugged the interior bulkhead and peered around the corner, but if he was surprised, the EET suit couldn't possibly move fast enough to get him out of the way of an assailant. The cam feed showed him the interior-facing bulkhead as Griggs sidled toward the elbow. When he reached the edge, he leaned slightly, his plasma rifle pointed down the corridor. Nothing there. Griggs turned his lights up to full, the light blinding to anyone looking into it. It shined all the way to the end of the corridor and the massive junction. That's one big lift, Griggs said. No shit, Recky said. Go ahead and scout all the way down. Zilf, move up. I want you three meters from our six. Copy, Griggs and Zilf said. Zilf fell into a slow jog, each footfall resulting in a noise like someone pounding the deck with a sledgehammer. If there was anyone in this area that didn't know they were coming, they certainly did now. Griggs made his way down the corridor, his steps longer, quieter. He and Li Xiao had the lightest suits and were capable of creeping up on unsuspecting targets. Reiki, Yuri, and Zilf, on the other hand, were the heavies. 
When walking on metal, ice, or a rocky surface, it was impossible for suits that large to even approximate stealth, unless your quarry was deaf or you were in vacuum. Or underwater, he said to himself. How loud were the suits underwater? Until now, the noise of his suit had never bothered him. Even at Handley 5, noise hadn't been a concern. The wind blew so hard on that planetoid that it was impossible for Zilf to hear the sound of his own servos. Here, though, every one of his steps elicited a tinny echo. Reckies, too. Zilf halted when he reached his terminus. One of the techs turned around to look at him. He couldn't see the face beneath the visor, and, in his EET suit, he stood nearly a meter taller than the tech. He flicked his eyes to Grix's cam feed. The scout was within five or so meters of the lift. Zilf didn't see any other signs of the mucus or more deep scratches. In a way, that didn't make him feel better. He almost wished that Griggs had found an assailant and neutralized them, so Zilf would no longer feel like he was being watched from the vents. The tech waved at him and said softly through the suit's external speakers, What's your name? The voice, slightly effeminate but definitely biologically male, held exhaustion and fear. Zilf guessed the man was talking simply to tame his own fear. Zilf, yours? Griggs had reached the lift and stopped a mere meter away from the large metal block. An angry red light glowed above the lift's closed hatch. Open it, boss. Open it, Recky said. Harvey, the tech said. Harvey Tire. Zilf barely realized he'd spoken. He was focused on Griggs's cam feed. Nice to meet you, Harvey, Zilf said. In a few minutes we can get to know one another. Right now? He pointed down the corridor. We need to get you and your team into that lift and back to the dock. Oh, the man said and turned. Right. Sorry. Zilf grinned in spite of himself. Ah, nervous tension. It made people say irrational things, ask irrational questions, and act irrationally. Small talk was not one of Zilf's strong suits, but he'd take it over panic and insanity any time. Except for now. With the tech admonished, he sidled closer to the exterior-facing bulkhead. Recky noticed what he was doing and said over her suit speakers, Give Zilf some room. He needs to get by. The techs shuffled aside and Recky had to turn sideways to make sure he had enough space, but it wasn't a problem. He continued walking until he reached the elbow. Griggs, 25 meters away, stood in front of the lift, his hand outstretched to the lift's control panel. One button, Griggs said with a chuckle. Too complex for me. He stabbed the oversized red button. The red light above the lift hatch blinked several times before turning yellow, and Zil felt vibrations through his armor-clad feet. The lift had to be massive. Then again, it had probably been built to hold 20 people comfortably. 30 or 40 if they didn't mind being squished together. The light blinked yellow a few more times before the sound of metal striking metal echoed through the corridor with a boom. The hatch light blinked off for a moment and returned with a bright, verdant green. Griggs, Ricky said. The techs tell me that lift shouldn't have had to come down. It should have already been here. Griggs stepped a few meters away from the hatch, his plasma rifle pointed forward. That's not good, he said. The hatch slid upward into its housing. Bright white light, probably chock full of UV, bathed the lift's empty interior. Griggs stepped to the threshold and panned his cam around the enclosed space. Shit, he said. Griggs' suit cam showed another set of those deep scratches on one of the lift's walls. The same wet substance stained the steel. Boss? Yeah, Recky said. Get in. We're coming. Zilf, stay put until we're inside. Copy. Recky's external speakers came to life. Head to the lift, she told the techs. I'm right behind you. The green-suited techs seemed to look at one another, unsure what to do. Then Harvey, at least Zilf thought it was Harvey, stepped past both his colleagues and Recky at a brisk pace. The other techs followed in his wake with a little less jump in their step. Got a live one, Zilf said to himself. Harvey Tyre was either the leader of the techs or someone that should be leading them. That was good. Keeping station denizens from panicking during emergency extraction was always difficult, but it was easier if one of their own kept their wits about them. Harvey was that person. The man was probably scared shitless. If Zilf wasn't in an EET suit, he would be too. When the other techs had walked four or five meters, Recky followed. Zilf maintained his position, watching for trouble, but mainly looking through his rear cam. 
That feeling they were being watched wouldn't go away, and he sure as shit didn't think it was from a surveillance camera. Griggs stood sentry just to the side of the lift, his plasma rifle pointed at the bulkhead. It took less than a minute for Recky and the text to reach him. Come on, Zilf, Recky said. Sepas, Zilf said, Mike muted. The Farsi word meant thank you, as Zilf meant it. Getting out of this corridor, out of this module, and back to the docks sounded like the best idea he'd heard in years. 